Subdural hematomas, nice bold red topic of our talk today. So what are the indications for surgery for a subdural hematoma? Are you going to do surgery on this one? But if you suggest that to your resident, you're probably not going to look so good, right? So what are the indications for surgery? This is, again, this is something you should be able to rattle off. This is in your Greenbergs. These are the clear indications for surgery on a subdural hematoma. So 10 millimeters thick, one centimeter thick, or five millimeters of midline shift, regardless of the GCS. Or if they have a low GCS and the subdural is small, but it's uh, having significant mass effect, then that's something that should come out. So if their GCS is declining, if they have asymmetric fixed or dilated pupils, or if you put ICP monitor in and they have a high ICP, those are all patients that should uh, consider undergoing surgical evacuation. But the one centimeter and the five millimeters of shift, that's the easy one to remember. Boom, be able to rattle that off. Know that these patients go to the OR. Um, and then patients with subdural hematoma and a low GCS should undergo ICP monitoring. Uh, ICP monitoring, we're going to get a little bit more into uh, in a bit, but just know that patients with a low GCS and a subdural hematoma, they're at risk of having an expansile mass, and that's why we put the ICP monitoring in, right? ICP monitoring is used to monitor patients to make sure that a mass is not expanding, and in this case, a subdural hematoma. So what are we going to do for our patient? We know he's got this small hematoma. He's confused. He, you know, probably can't be left unsupervised. Are we worried that that hematoma is going to expand? Are we worried <clears throat> that his coagulopathy is going to become a problem? So yeah, it, that's certainly something we want to be worried about. So we're going to admit him to the ICU. Uh, SF General, we're lucky enough to have a neurosurgery ICU. Uh, so that's where we're going to admit him, where we have nurses that specialize in uh, neurosurgical care, neurocritical care. Uh, and so they're able to keep a close eye on them. We trust them with the neuro checks. We're going to want to do Q1 hour neuro checks <clears throat> with NPIs, the pupillometers. If any of you haven't seen the pupillometers, great devices. They give you an objective reading of the patient's pupil reactivity. Uh, and it's one of the first uh, earlier, earliest signs of a increasing intracranial pressure is a reduction in pupil reactivity. So a really cool device. It gives you an objective measurement above four is normal. Uh, if you see a patient that has an NPI before and it starts to go down, you really want, that's a red, uh, red alert alarm that you want to know about uh, and investigate. You want to get a repeat head CT in four hours. And this is a big, big thing. So when you order that repeat head CT, set a timer. All right. If you're the med student, if you're the lower level resident, set a timer. I've been burned by this. Um, and I know from experience, I'm happy to tell, talk about some of my failures. This is one where uh, I have not set a timer. You go back to sleep. It's the middle of the night. You wake up seven hours later, and for some reason, the head CT didn't get done. The nurse either didn't see the order, uh, the patient, they, they thought maybe it wasn't so urgent, um, <clears throat> or the head CT got done and had a, a bad finding, and you weren't there to look at it. Uh, so set a timer, knowing that head, C head CT should be done, and make sure you follow through on that. that that's something that makes you look really, really bad uh, if you've set a, uh, a scheduled CT, uh, a scheduled imaging exam, and you don't follow through on it. It makes you look bad. So set a timer for that repeat head CT. That's important, right? Because progression or radiographic stability of that subdural hematoma is really going to dictate the rest of this patient's care. It's that first four-hour window that's going to tell you whether or not this is going to expand. How are you going to start them with some dilantin for anti-epileptics? We're going to go into that. And then because we're not just neurosurgeons, we're doctors, uh, we're going to take care of the other organ systems. So cardiovascularly, we want to make sure we have good blood pressure control. This is the patient. Again, it's a drinker. He's probably got some underlying hypertension. If we allow his blood pressure to run up and get out of control, that could cause this subdural hematoma to expand. And that's not something we want. Uh, we want to make sure that he's getting enough oxygen, hypoxemia, Hypercarbia could cause increased intracranial pressure, so at least he needs to be on nasal cannula. Um, <clears throat> for FENGI, we're going to keep him NPO, right? If this is an expansile mass lesion, we don't want him filling his, his belly full of food if he's going to need an emergency surgery. That would be dangerous. He's also confused, so he's probably not going to, he's at a higher risk of aspiration. He's not going to be swallowing all that well. So we want to make sure that we uh, keep him NPO. And while anybody's NPO, they need to be on IV fluids. That's a rule. So normal saline is good. Uh, we don't want to put them on any hypoosmolar fluid like half normal saline uh, or PD light, something like that, because uh, that would uh, cause the sodium to drop and could cause increased intracranial pressure and a bowel regimen, right? Any patient that's in the hospital should be pooping. Uh, if he end, end up, ends up having increased intracranial pressure, uh, you can actually get an abdominal compartment syndrome from uh, constipation, which can worsen your ICP issues. 
uh, heme ID. And we want to get something called a ROTIM or a TEG. Uh, these are coagulation studies I'm going to get to in just a second. Um, but they tell you more than just the INR and the platelet numbers. And then DVT prophylaxis, uh, nothing for him except for some SCDs because you don't want to give him sub-Q heparin or an oxyparin um, because the, he's at risk of having an expansile uh, hematoma. Uh, the Rotem or the TEG, these are thromboelastography devices. They're really cool. They actually give you a lot more information, like I said, than just your INR platelet level. So you want to consider these in any patient that comes in where you're questioning uh, how good their coagulation is. Uh, and basically what the little thing does is you put a drop of blood in this device and it measures how long it takes the clot to form and it measures the thickness of the clot and how long the clot takes to break down. So it gives you the coagulation and fibrinolysis numbers. Uh, you can look up all these numbers on your own, but it basically tells you if the patient's lacking in factors or platelets um, or what have you. It really lets you drill down on what could potentially give them a coagulopathy. So really important to look beyond just your PTT, your INR, and your platelet levels, uh, but to look at something like a thromboelastography. So there's some cool data out there. I encourage you guys to look these up, but uh, that's all I'm going to go into it for this talk. So, Hey, everyone. Ryan Rad here from neurosurgerytraining.org. If you like that video, subscribe and donate to keep our content available for medical students across the world.